India is a net importer of energy. It's incorrect. It's not only incorrect, it's false. It's a, it's a rumor being spread for the last 40 years. Everything tends to link climate outcome with energy usage. The energy that leads to climate change, 90% of that goes into either transportation, into buildings, or into industry. So climate change is really not only about the big ticket items. It is often about the small ticket items. Yes. I would think that it, the nicest thing would be if everybody took mass transport, if all the mass transport was run by renewable power, and the renewable power was local to every area so that we didn't have huge grids and transmission lines and losses. Instead of simply making a pitch to a VC saying, I'm doing this, this is wow, please come and fund me, do the due diligence around it. So that the aviation industry contributes only 2 to 3% of the total emissions in the world. We forget that the vitrified tile and glass industry contributes the same amount. We are not talking about sustainable vitrified tiles and sustainable glass yet. Welcome back to another amazing episode of The Glampanor Show. On today's episode, we are speaking with someone I feel is one of the highest honors and privilege of my life to speak to him. We are speaking with Dr. Anjan Ray, the director of CSIR in Institute of Petroleum. This episode, for me, was a big reveal. This episode is going to change what climate change and climate action means for you. This episode is going to tell you what India is doing. So please do not miss this episode. Play it once, twice, thrice or how many times. This episode is always going to bring to you surprise and love for the country and love for the climate scientists. I owe this episode to every climate scientist, to every person who is working actively towards climate action. And thank you, Dr. Anjan, for being on the podcast. This episode stands my highest privilege on The Climatepreneur Show. I hope you enjoy the conversation. While you do that, please do not forget to hit the subscribe button. Welcome, Dr. Anjan, on The Climatepreneur Show. It's my highest privilege and honor to be speaking to you and talking to you here. So, like, thank you for being with us today here. Thank you so much for inviting me. So, you know, like, you are a part of an industry for space right now that really, I feel, has the potential to drive climate action, to potential to drive the goals that we all are talking about around the around the globe, basically. So, you know, what do you think is the relationship between petroleum and climate change? Um, that's my favorite topic almost. Yeah. But I want to take you... A little bit to a wider view than climate action and energy, right? These sort of individual silos mm -hmm. were probably all right 25 years ago when in 2000 the United Nations put together the Millennium Development Goals. And by the time we got to 2015, it was obvious that they were working but not well enough because you still had poverty, you still had hunger, you still had cities and communities that were accumulating waste. That's how in 2015, we got the Sustainable Development Goals with the 2030 horizon. And climate action is one of those. And affordable and clean energy is one other of those. But all 17 goals are interlinked. So although we, obviously we have to pick and choose our battles with our resources and our capabilities. And I myself, as well as the institute where I am, the CSIR Indian Institute of Petroleum, we work on broadly two mandates. One is improve India's energy security and energy access, and the other is decarbonize India's energy footprint. But energy is the key. If we look at all the statements made in the UN deliberations or in the COPs that are going on, conference of parties, etc., or the IPCC, almost everything tends to link climate outcome with energy usage. And an easy way to understand that is that the energy that leads to climate change, 90% of that goes into either transportation, into buildings, or into industry. Um, this is where 
there is a hidden gem that most people didn't know until my team brought it out about a year and a half ago. That the first line of defense for climate action, for climate change, is the humble lubricant. I don't know if you heard this before. Let me take you to very basic uh, physics. You would have learned at some point in your career that to convert energy into useful work always requires a machine, always, invariably. So any human anthropological development, as we call it in our words, requires a machine, and therefore it will take energy from somewhere and will produce work from somewhere. And we also know that no machine is 100% efficient. It can't convert all the energy into work. So every machine is wasting a certain amount of energy, and that wastage is anthropogenic climate change from energy. And the only thing that can make a machine really more efficient apart from redesign is a good lubricant. If a machine has a moving part, it needs a lubricant. Most machines in the world simply use the lubricant that was recommended to it by the machine manufacturer. The machine manufacturer does not actually know what the best lubricant is. They just know the one they're most familiar with. And the difference between a normal lubricant and the best lubricant for a machine can be as much as 3% energy efficiency. So 3% of the global impact on climate change could be addressed by lubricants alone. It requires a mindset. It requires everybody who either manufactures, sells, or uses a machine to actually invest in finding out what's the best lubricant for a machine, also to change the lubricant, and to keep an eye on is the machine efficiency changing. That's when you know whether other things are at play. Because a lubricant is managing two surfaces that are rubbing against each other. And those surfaces have rough edges, very fine rough edges, even they might be very polished. And those edges we call asperities. And if I have too much of lubricant, that has its own problem. For example, if you have no friction and you're walking on a smooth floor, the chances of a fall are high. Now on a dance floor, you're probably okay with that. Uh, in a bathroom where an old person is going, you're probably not okay with that. So climate change is really not only about the big ticket items. It is often about the small ticket items that people don't notice, where if I were able to make a billion people do things differently, you get a different result. And again, as you said, like it requires that kind of observation, that kind of mindset. Like, for example, the lubricant thing that you just shared, like how many of us, like it would be like still be used in so many factories, but how many of us do really understand that? I'll give you another example. In your own house, mm -hmm. you live in the NCR region, right? Yeah. Do you have a LPG cylinder or you have pipe gas or both? Cylinder. You have a cylinder. Now, a lot of the cities are going into pipe gas. And what they're doing is they're taking their old cooking range and they are making some minor adjustments and hooking it up to pipe gas. Only thing is, pipe gas is chemically different from LPG. LPG is heavier than air, about one and a half times heavier than air. And pipe gas is about uh, one third lighter than air. So if I use the same burner, the same gas stove for both, you can be sure that at least 15-20% of my pipe gas is escaping to the atmosphere. Pipe gas happens to be methane. It is 25 to 80 times more potent than CO2 for greenhouse, for global warming. But nobody notices this loss. So one of the things we have done, we have launched a dedicated pipe gas burner across India. And we're hoping that maybe a one crore households will have it over the next few years. And that will save India not only a significant amount of climate impact, it will actually save money because we are importing natural gas. And to import natural gas, I'm spending a carbon footprint in some LNG tanker, which is bringing it from offshore. And then using pipelines, which also has a cost. A pipeline sounds easy, but a gas pipeline has a compressor, which will periodically increase the pressure. Every compressor is a rotating equipment, so it's a machine, so it uses energy. All these things become interlinked. 
and like these are like it's just so small and little things but the impact that they make and especially when for example we're talking about pipeline how many households how many kitchens today in india are using pipeline and if every kitchen could like just save that the kind of impact we would have burner. that would be like just amazing. change the burner yeah just change the burner and the and the saving in the gas itself will pay them back in a, maybe a, a year and a half or two years but the saving to the climate would be very significant right another simple thing to think about and i'm surprised there is no startup in india doing this yet is air conditioning uh in a room where there's one person sitting and an ac is running the ac is intended to cool the person but it's cooling the floor the carpet the uh, furniture everything else so maybe less than 5% of the energy being spent in the ac and the corresponding climate impact is actually serving the purpose that it is intended for so i expect that in the next few years as climate change discourses gather momentum personal cooling solutions or personal comfort solutions will actually start getting momentum and what about the transportation sector my favorite area uh i would think that it, the nicest thing would be if everybody took mass transport if all the mass transport was run by renewable power and the renewable power was local to every area so that we didn't have huge grids and transmission lines and losses but that's not the way it happens there is an installed base the same thing with biofuels there is an installed base of 90 million tons uh, 90 million barrels of oil being refined every day around the world and there's pipelines there's refineries there's uh, oil fields linked to that so biofuels will succeed when they become drop in when they can use the same pipeline they can use the same car they can use so i believe that the whole area of drop in biofuels is a bigger area than areas of uh, substitute fuels like ethanol is not the same as gasoline that's why you're only able to blend up to 20% you can go to a flex fuel car but it has its own uh, costs and implications for india's energy security ethanol is a great idea uh, that's because you can make it here using carbon atoms available inside the country let me give you another interesting stat we've all learned from childhood you probably learned in your studies in the uk that india is a net importer of energy it's incorrect it's not only incorrect it's false it's a it's a rumor being spread for the last 40 years because we don't import energy we import carbon atoms we are used to handling carbon atoms in the form of crude oil coal and natural gas we import in a year about 350 million tons of carbon atoms from foreign shores paying for an exchange and using a carbon footprint that's invisible to us because it's somebody else's tanker or somebody else's uh, airplane or some whatever else right but as a country our 1.4 billion population throws 550 million tons of carbon atoms every year more than we import so if we learn to repurpose carbon atoms in this country and learn to repurpose it to scale we can actually someday stand up and say we don't need your carbon how do you think that we can repurpose carbon atoms at scale it's been done we are making small beginnings and we are looking for partners who can take these ideas and run with them but already there are many entrepreneurs in india who are say converting plastic into fuel it's not high quality fuel but if the fuel quality were properly addressed and the implications of burning that fuel in terms of air pollution were studied and corrected i think we have a good ecosystem but what happens in india a lot of people will collect plastic or urban waste and say we are making a biofuel that's an unregulated biofuel when you burn it you will emit toxins into the air and those toxins will have their own impact so you'll have created a new problem what i always suggest is that when you have an entrepreneur who's doing any unregulated fuel it should go through an entrepreneur self check of ticking the boxes of is it safe is it good for health is it uh, uh, going to enable a true carbon footprint saving instead of simply making a pitch to a vc saying i'm doing this this is wow please come and fund me do the due diligence around it so that when the story goes into the world people 
acknowledge it not from the pitch but from the outcome definitely and i think this is one important element so like do you also help like entrepreneurs who are working in this space do that yes we we are very happy to help entrepreneurs to improve their offering we are happy to help them integrate their supply chains because technology is a very small part of a business ecosystem there are three things that entrepreneurs forget they get married to their idea but they forget that when somebody is going to go from status quo to something new three things must happen first it must create value in the eyes of the user otherwise there's no market second it must be measurable in currency that currency could be and i'll give you examples that currency could be a time value of money for example so a farmer in a small village has to take his tractor 20 kilometers to the nearest petrol pump and back and in doing so he will spend 4 liters of diesel going and coming if i taught the farmer to make his own diesel i save those four but the farmer sees it as the opportunity cost of mm. going and coming back right so you know last week i was in a small village near hastinapur in up and we were talking about some of these ideas so the second thing for the entrepreneur is that measured in money and the third thing which every entrepreneur i see every startup tends to forget in their early pitches is relative to the next best alternative including do nothing and emerging alternatives very often their solution is static not recognizing that both the market and the customer need might be shifting over the next period so we try to support entrepreneurs we are usually pretty direct and blunt so uh, that is more time efficient though it's not always uh, i would say emotionally nice but we will tell entrepreneurs what they can do to review their uh, offering and if the offering is good we will link them up with other people who can help them build supply chains and what do you think are like some of the opportunities for say entrepreneurs or some of the problem statements for entrepreneurs in this space problem statements for entrepreneurs are almost infinite but the problem statement that i have for entrepreneurs is that most entrepreneurs see their problem statement offering outwards they have an idea this idea solves this problem they don't look at what other problems it creates so any entrepreneur in the climate space i always suggest that they start with the 17 sdgs and 169 metrics these are public domain and see how many of the sdgs and metrics they can address the more inclusive that solution is the better the chance that it will get funded right if you pick one out of 169 metrics the chance of being successful is actually very low at least for the long term as you want people to build sustainable businesses the other thing i normally will tell a young entrepreneur is please go take a coursera course on working capital most people look at profitability almost nobody looks at cash flow and as scientists we were never taught cash flow but when i ran businesses when i had to launch products deal with ideas you recognize that if there is no cash flow there is no business it doesn't matter how good your idea is so i also feel this one thing i don't like correct me if i'm wrong that sometimes you know like we have to think ahead of the user's need like right now the user probably might be telling me that i don't need this, this is not going to work but you have to be prepared for the time when he knows like when he will be needing that and you have to think ahead of it so for example like what happened with you know flex fuel and when all these terms were coming up people were like a bit like okay you know it's okay but petrol diesel it's never going anywhere i don't know how long things will work for example with the ethanol thing also like few things which i have heard is that how sustainable the production is like how long are we able to do that so during that point when everyone around you is telling you that this is not going to work so how do you like take that i think one has to start with a very simple premise that when somebody tells you something it is based on their information domain right unless and this is true in human relationships too unless you understand the intent behind somebody telling you something you will 
most likely misinterpret it. If somebody tells you ethanol doesn't work, you have to ask the question by saying that, do you mean that the way ethanol is made today is unsustainable? Or the way ethanol used in engines is unsustainable? Or do you think that ethanol itself is harmful in some way? Let's try to break it down into what is the problem? Because then you can solve the problem. So ethanol is not the problem because ethanol has run engines for a long time. But if I use ethanol from sugarcane and the sugarcane is produced in a water intensive manner and after I produce the ethanol from the cane juice, I'm not able to fully utilize my cane trash in the field or the bagasse that came out then I have a problem, right? If I don't do my life cycle analysis, which is LCA modeling, for a particular ethanol plant, and I say all ethanol plants are the same and they're all good for the environment, I'm making a mistake. But if I say all ethanol plants are bad for the environment, then I'm throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? There's, for example, a company called Lanzatec. I don't know if you've heard of them. You should look them up. Lanzatec is one of the most exciting, uh, they're no longer a startup really, they're a well-invested company. And they are making ethanol from steel mill emissions and from petroleum emissions. So they have a bug, a microbe, that ferments carbon monoxide and hydrogen and turns it into ethanol. It's a wonderful idea. But it will, Lanzatec started out in 2005 and they're getting to fruition today. So. They were ahead of the times, but they, first of all, had to have the staying power to build prototypes. They had to convince a steel mill in China to test the prototype. And today, uh, Indian Oil is putting up a Lanzatec unit in Panipat to make ethanol. Now, if they had just stopped there, this, so the next thing is, how do you reinvent, right? This is similar to the work that my institute has done on, let's say, sustainable aviation fuel. That journey started in 2009. The first plane flew in 2018. The first commercial plant is going to be up and running in 2025. So every time somebody says to me, it doesn't work, I refer them back to Thomas Edison, who said, anytime a new idea comes, the first reaction of people will be, it doesn't work. After a few years, when it's shown to be working, they will say it works, but it'll never make money. And after 20 years, when it's working and making money all over the world, they will say, it's there, you know, it's not new. What's the big deal? So I think a successful technologist and a successful entrepreneur need to have two things. One is a great deal of self-criticism and a great deal of persistence for those course corrections, whether it is in the technology or the business model or in alignment to customer needs. Definitely well said on that. And, you know, coming to sustainable avi aviation. So like uh, first thing, like let's like first break down what sustainable aviation is and why do we need to make the aviation sustainable? Like I read that recently, like you have also signed an MOU with, you know, like uh, Tata Air Services as well. So like why are today airlines looking towards going sustainable? First of all, nobody goes sustainable unless they make money. So all along, when the global regulatory framework did not demand sustainability, nobody talked about it. Today, not only sustainability, but that entire ESG, environmental social governance piece, is so powerful that if two companies with identical balance sheets go to a banker, the lending rate for the less sustainable company could be 1% higher than the more sustainable company. Right? So sustainability is now an economic imperative. That's why people are going there. Let's not believe that it is for altruism. It is. I mean, everybody likes to believe it's altruistic, but given a choice between the altruism and making money, they would go where the money is. That's why people are going there now. Whereas we had the solution in 2009 at the lab stage. When the first plane flew in 2018 for India, the first global flight took place between 2006 and 2008. Several global flights took place. Um, there was no great pressure on sustainable aviation fuel. It was fashionable. Now, the aviation industry contributes only 2 to 3% of the total emissions 
in the world. We forget that the vitrified tile and glass industry contributes the same amount. We are not talking about sustainable vitrified tiles and sustainable glass yet. We will at some point. Right? Because you know, imagine to make tile or glass, everything is run in a furnace. Then you transport things which are all low density. So, you know, the carbon footprint is humongous. But aviation is easy. It's seen as a prerogative of the rich. And therefore, it is an easy thing to target. Right? Somebody who can barely afford to take a bus between villages is not going to fly a plane anytime soon. So the ability to load a cost on aviation allows it to be something that ought to. Uh, going back to the first of the sustainable development goals of no poverty, aviation should self-regulate its emissions because it can afford to do so. Right? The people who can fly should be able to afford to pay. And therefore, the target was, can those 2% of the global emissions be brought down and some very brave steps were taken by the aviation sector, particularly at the 2016 International Civil Aviation Organization meet in Hanoi. Uh, a decision was taken that a market mechanism called Carbon Offsetting Reduction for Sustainable International Aviation, Corsia, would be put in place. And Corsia is now in its voluntary phase. By 2027, it's in a mandatory phase. Everybody has to do it. So an airplane flying from India to somewhere in Europe an airline rather, who is not compliant with the Corsia requirements to reduce their emissions, will end up paying you know, several lakhs of rupees uh, per year just to meet the Corsia obligations in terms of, it won't be a penalty, it will be an obligation cost. So it is better that that airline starts using aviation fuel before 2027. So that's the magic date. That's why we are seeing a lot of interest in India to build by both routes. One is what we call HEFA, which is using oils and fats to make aviation fuel. That's the process my team uses. And the other is a process called ATJ, alcohol to jet, which at least two companies in India, Praj Industries and Indian Oil, are working on commercializing. So we'll see multiple pathways. Coming back to waste carbon atoms, these are different ways of using different waste carbon atoms but getting to the same aviation fuel. Well, that's really interesting, you know, and like, what what do you think that takes us so long to, for example, have that fuel? For example, you said that we have been working on it for so many years now. So my point here is that what are the challenges we are facing to like have that like fuel in our hand right now? So there are only three pieces, right? The first piece is... Uh, Actually, let me, let me correct myself. I'd say there are five pieces. The first piece is proof performance equivalence. Prove that it is as good as the existing fuel. Otherwise, people's lives will be at stake. right? But more than people's lives, the airline operator will say, I will be hit with the liability. You're not going to get the liability. The engine manufacturer will say that I won't allow the airline to use it if my engine has not been tested with it. right? So first one is performance. The second one is scale. Can I get enough? Why should I go through the trouble of testing performance and putting planes at risk or engines at risk if I can't get a million tons a year? So where is the supply chain that will give me those carbon atoms for that aviation fuel? The third is cost. I mean, you might be willing to pay a premium. All of us paid a premium for mobile telephony in the early days when calls were 16 rupees you know, a minute. And incoming calls were also 16 rupees a minute. Today, because there's enough scale of operation, things have come down. Same was true with solar. Just yesterday, I was at this absolutely phenomenal lecture by uh, Mr. Shamsaran, former uh, Indian foreign secretary, who was also one of our negotiators for climate change. And he pointed out that when solar was started in 2007, the target was to meet grid parity in 2022, but it happened by 2016, because once people saw the benefits, they adopted it. I think the same will be true here. Right? So the, we've covered three. I've covered performance, cost, scale. Uh, then we have supply chain, right? which links to scale, but it's also about who makes money. Can I get a farmer to make money? Can I get a tribal collector to make money? 
can I get a tobacco farmer to give me his tobacco seeds for oil to make jet fuel? Because tobacco has always been a you know, not so popular word. But can tobacco be reinvented for jet fuel? So these all take time because you're working with ecosystems. With each subcomponent of the ecosystem, I have to go back to the, you know, in the uh, eyes of the user measured in money relative to the next best alternative. For each stakeholder, I've got to do that. It's an it's a enormous effort. And where are we, like, currently? We're doing fairly well. Like I said, the first plant has been signed. It is getting designed. It will get built by 2025. And 20,000 liters will come out every day from that plant. It's a good number. So in perspective, a Delhi-Bombay flight takes about 3,000 liters. So 20,000 liters will fly a few, pl few planes a day. The Indian Air Force has committed to using it. Indian Air Force also? Yeah, they've already approved it at 10% blending in their planes. Mm -hmm. uh, they've flown an AN-32 at a Republic Day fly past. Mm -hmm. We've flown a transport aircraft into Leh in deep winter to show that the fuel works even under extreme conditions. So all of those are good stories, but the time for execution is now. How do you feel like, you know, because you have been working on this like since so long and now when you see this happening, like, you know, for example, Indian Air Force and the flight that we're talking about, how do you feel from inside, like as a person there? You know, it is the same thrill or kick that you get from, let's say, doing adventure sports or winning a debate. It's like you have a goal, you know this goal is a long haul yes. and it's 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 these are all these are all marathons they're not sprints right mm -hmm. so if i can take a track and field analogy mm -hmm. so when you finish the marathon unless you are a truly competitive runner mm -hmm. you're not worrying about how much time you took you're worrying about whether you finished yes. it's mostly that and what would be your finish line like what is for you as a person the goal you know when Climate change and climate science, there is no finish, is line. No finish line. We need to get the earth back to <laughs> yeah. where it was. Do you think it can get back to where it was? I can't talk about the earth because I don't influence the earth. Mm. But if you came visit our campus, I go out for an evening walk, I will find a leopard, a deer or a fox on my walk. And, uh, you know, they coexist with us humans and nobody is stressed out. And I think that is where we want to be at the very least. Definitely. So, you know, like before we actually move to, you know, tiles in class, uh, I want to know from you that where today, like, for example, come organizations like Indian Oil and Bharat Petroleum are in terms of the technological advancements. So, like, where do they stand today? Because, you know, there's always this narrative that burning of fossil fuels has led to the maximum amount of climate change. So, like, what are your thoughts on it? And where are these organizations today? I would say that the Indian oil sector, in fact, the global oil sector today, is a lot more conscious and participating in the energy transition. Indian oil is an outlier. They were the first to move. They moved very quickly. Today, BPCL, HPCL, Reliance, everyone's doing it. And they're all doing it because there's an economic driver, but also because there is, for the state-owned companies, there is also a very strong national push. The policies have really moved favorably in this direction. Right. I'll give you another simple example of something we do, which... Uh, you know, if I just converted every car into an EV, I don't actually help climate change because I'm still on a coal-driven grid, okay. right? But two things that we've been able to do. I was in Manipur 10 days ago, mm. and we met with the Honorable Chief Minister, and Manipur gets all its fuel from Assam. It comes 1,000 kilometers down. Mm. To transport 100 liters of diesel, 1,000 kilometers, I spend one liter of diesel. Right? So Manipur is one of the ripest states or further south, Tripura, Mizoram, these states are very ripe for taking old vehicles and retrofitting them into electric vehicles. So you never throw away the vehicle, you never scrap it, because there's no vehicle scrapping there. No, I'll have to transport the vehicle back to Assam or Bengal at the very least. Then I have to separate all the components. I have to melt it using heat. I have to refabricate it in, into something using heat. So in Manipur, you could just change, take out the old engine, put a motor, connect the motor to a battery. So by way of demonstration, what I drive myself is a 1987 Zen, which is retrofitted to electric. That's what I drive, right? It gives me 60 kilometers uh, per charge, and it can go at 60 kilometers an hour. Right? Uh, so I think when we train 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000 people across India to retrofit cars, we will have a different ecosystem. By that time, 
we will also start making the grid fully renewable. So in my campus, we have a 15 kilowatt uh, charging station. This runs without battery. There is no battery in the charging station for backup, but we run solar, wind, and biogas. Whatever is available runs the power, and we have a smart controller that switches between these three. So there is no non-renewable component in the power system. That doesn't mean it's net zero, because I've had to spend some carbon footprint to get it there to get and to install mm -hmm. it and in making the components, but it's still much better than where we could be. So as a research organization, we build prototypes. We try to fire people's imagination. And then when people adopt it, then we're able to roll it out. Another example is biodiesel. Biodiesel is something that's been around for a long time. India's first biodiesel discussions came in 2003. Globally, they came in the 1990s. There are countries like Indonesia and Malaysia which produce very large quantities. But in India, the biggest problem was biodiesel is made from oils and fats. How do you collect them? Now with uh, government policies, particularly a policy from Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, FSSAI, which says that if you're a dhaba or a restaurant, you can't throw your cooking oil or reuse it. After two or three uses, you must give it for biodiesel manufacturing. Right? Because if you reuse cooking oil, it causes health issues. Yes. Now there's an app called Ruko. Today, while I'm speaking here, a uh, Ruko exponent from Bombay is speaking in JNU at an exhibition come conference called STRI, run purely by women and entrepreneurs and scientists. And India imports and uses uh, 21 and 27 million tons of oil, edible oil. So more than 10% is wasted. If I can collect just that, 2, uh, 2 million tons. 2 million tons represents uh, close to a million tons of CO2 footprint saved. Right. So what we did, we realized that the big problem was not the technology. The big problem was the collection. So we essentially changed the game. The moment I, I told you, machines are a problem, right? So we built a very simple machine. It's just a stirred tank. You can add the waste cooking oil or the animal fat or whatever with some chemicals and reactants. You add everything by hand. It can be stirred by unskilled labor. And you leave it on the table and your diesel is made in about a couple of hours. You just come and take it out. So we're calling it Gao Gao Me Biodiesel. The first unit is running in Chhattisgarh. Uh, the second unit, we hope, will come up in our parliament house when it is rebuilt. And we think that 50,000, 60,000 of these units would not be a problem across India. They're, and they're not expensive, right? They're making 160 liters of diesel each, and they cost about 5 lakhs to put in. So These are the disruptive ideas at scale, decentralized, where every user is also either a producer or a participant in the sustainable supply chain. If somebody else is producing and somebody else is using, you don't value it. We are sitting in a room where there's bright sunshine outside, but we have lights up here, right? We have an LED screen on there, which is not doing anything. It's showing a static uh, image. That LED screen uh, has the carbon footprint um, of a light bulb. Every, yeah? Every good morning message you send Every Google search you do will keep a, a normal night light on for a couple of seconds. So it is about not only sensitizing users, it is about institutionalizing practices that can add up to scale. Yeah. A billion people doing one small thing well is better than one large organization doing one large thing for a short period of time and then just putting it on their annual report. You know, since we like also talked about retrofitting the vehicles, what do you think like is like what what do you think is going to happen in terms of example, like are we going to go for like a hybrid, like say we have electric, we have biodiesel, we have biofuels. So like what is the transportation sector going to look like? I think there will be transitions, right? 
in any sector when there are competing alternatives mm. it will come back to those three Would points Would you say that these are competing alternatives or like like all these alternatives like you know complement each other in the transition that we are They complement each other but look at the way marketing happens If you are an organization A doing alternative X and organization B is doing alternative Y you will not necessarily acknowledge that Y is superior to X or or complementary to X you will want your market share right it's the uh, same thing let's say between the digital camera and the mobile phone as a camera right today the mobile phone is winning right that's because it's a more convenient alternative other things uh, being equal so my view is that alternatives must be very well customized to the local ecosystem and the better you customize the more local people you bring in the better your result another example that i can give you from a recent visit people are very conscious about diabetes now so a lot of people are trying to not use sugar so demand for jaggery for gur is increasing right india is one of the world's largest producers of jaggery 15% of the country's sugar cane goes towards jaggery plus there's also gur being produced in bengal from dates and so on however if you see the way gur is produced it's a you know big fat open pan and people just shove the sugar cane bagasse into it and they keep boiling the sugar cane juice and it spews out smoke because they're burning bagasse and lots of black particulate matter goes out in the air very simple thermal redesign of this and we now have i just inaugurated the 60th unit last week across uttarakhand and uttar pradesh just by imp- uh you know employing thermal science basic physics and some core mechanical engineering we are able to reduce that consumption of the bagasse which is being burnt by 25% bring the particulate matter down and now a good bhatti in merit or muzaffarnagar or uh, uh haridwar area where we have put these the neighboring good bhattis are black smoke and the workers can barely stand there Ours are white smoke, and the workers actually like being there because the smell is, you know, light and gentle and fresh. And the gur comes out golden because it is not getting overheated. And again, that requires that kind of observation, the mindset that you talked about when you said. Yeah, but what happens once the people see it, they uh-huh. want it. They want it. So you know, like we are hearing a lot about hydrogen fuel. Why is it considered like a good option, and what are the challenges that we are facing regarding it? hydrogen is a good option because we are used like i said to a carbon fuel diet a uh, typical carbon based fuel even the cleanest one um other than natural gas you know the cleanest pure carbon fuel otherwise would be propane or lpg they have carbon carbon bonds every time i have a carbon carbon bond when i burn it i will create some particulate matter some soot the second thing is hydrogen is very energy dense its mass density is much higher than most things but immediately the problem comes being a gas it is very <coughs> light from a volume point of view so i have to compress it to get the mass energy density to my advantage compression itself has a cost both energy cost and financial cost that's why adoption is slow i think the future will belong to hydrogen carrier systems either solids or liquids which are hydrogen proxies two good ones one is a, there's a term actually already in the market and people have started doing this in japan liquid uh hydrogen carriers liquid organic hydrogen carriers lohc if you look that up you'll find lots of stuff on it so one of those lohcs is uh something called cyclo hexane and that for example work is being done in national environmental engineering research institute in nagpur another one which indian policy makers have really looked at and i believe it's a good one is methanol methanol has no carbon carbon bonds and it is essentially a molecule of carbon dioxide along with two molecules of hydrogen so it's a very useful uh, molecule and it could be an easy way so wherever you have hydrogen produced you capture carbon dioxide from the air you make methanol locally then you ship methanol it's a liquid so it will go into the existing pipeline infrastructure whatever and then you simply send it into a car or if you need to take out hydrogen you take out hydrogen from the methanol by a catalytic process
so can this like really happen on the existing infrastructure for example like the petrol pumps we currently have you could theoretically yes have you know the pumps repurposed for methanol mm-hmm. but you'll have to change the metallurgy because methanol is uh, differently corrosive mm-hmm. than petroleum so the, the same pump designs will remain this but you might have to do, make metallurgy changes even with ethanol blending mm-hmm. some met- some changes had to be made in like the gaskets and the pistons and the o-rings and so on so you know like we talked about that how say people are not acceptive of the idea so do you think that the financial institutions have a role to play probably some kind of incentives that they can provide i started by mentioning esg if you remember yeah. that already lending rates have become differential between green and not so green india has been fairly quick in putting together dedicated financial institutions like ireda and nabard who support these kinds of innovations and another very big breakthrough which i think really helped our bio economy which also eventually plugs into the energy economy was the establishment of something called birac mm. yeah biotechnology incubation research assistance center by the department of biotech government of india i think the more we have finances being moved into a loan come grant mode and where accountability for proper use of public money and grants is enforced the better results we will see and uh, we we are seeing you know thailand has done quite well in this area brazil did well before the recent economic crisis they ran into small companies like slovenia small, small countries like slovenia do actually quite well so i think it is about finding the best practice around the world and adapting them suitably to india and it is picking up momentum i think that our lenders and our financial institutions are maturing from this green standpoint but like everything it's a process it's not overnight and you know like uh, let's now like switch to construction industry basically because you mentioned all the construction is like an important element to it so like share with me that how is this industry contributing or like what are some of the elements which people often miss when talked about this industry there are three big chunks in a building or three big phases of a life of a building the first is when you build it are your supply chain sustainable are your building materials coming from sustainable sources or are you dredging a river bed uh, somewhere and getting the sand so the first is that one what's going into building it the second is the building design itself the architecture the lighting is it zero net energy so if you go to lay a zero net energy building is coming up in lay because they have a lot of geothermal energy underground that you can use surprisingly in india the builders have not looked at geothermal energy at all whereas in place like delhi it makes so much sense geothermal energy can be thought of very simply that if i go 30 feet below the ground here the air at that point is at the average temperature of the whole year so this room if i left it to itself without any cooling heating would right now be at something like 25 26 degrees it would be at about 8 or 9 degrees at night it would be 40 degrees in the summer but if i am able to circulate the air from 30 feet below it will be 25 degrees all year there's actually a building like that in gwal pahari uh, built by terry several years ago it's still out there and they're able to utilize 50 60% of the earth's heat to keep the building either hot or cold right so the second part is how is the building designed if it's a lot of glass frontage which seems to become fashionable in india then how much sunlight are you putting in that's going to heat up the place and then that air conditioning mm-hmm. how much of the air conditioning will you waste to just cool a body right uh places which have hvac you know um, there are a lot of people innovating in hvac air quality etc hvacs are energy hogs mm-hmm. right wherever i have an hvac can i use mechanical vapor recompression or can i use other intelligent mechanical cycles to give some of the excess energy back because once i've pr- pressurized the air in a hvac that air has energy but i am not using the energy anymore can i reuse the energy somewhere right so there's a lot of i think also entrepreneurs need to keep investing in science they need to keep talking to r and d uh, ecosystems and they need to question themselves what is how will i make it better i mean sure chal raha chalne do you know we sell it we are making money but what can i do to make it better for the planet 
and i think there is another collaborative element which can come into picture that how do say entrepreneurs and say scientists and research organizations actually work together because i think like there is some great great research that's happening in for example the thing that you are telling right now i do not i don't think that i knew like even half of them like we always talk about what is india doing what are we doing but these are things that are actually happening yeah. they are not something some far fetched goals and for example the biodiesel thing you to- talked about it's happening right. the change has begun and now how do we just you know like all of us become that part of that dialogue like dialogue that leads to some collaborative steps that dialogue that leads to some actions being taken and i think i skipped this part like while we were talking about this earlier i also read that uh, you have like uh, the roads that we make are coming from bio like bio bitumen like from the bio rice straw right yeah. and this also saves india a huge amount of money because we import bitumen. bitumen from outside so like please share about that as well that is still fairly early stage i would say we've been given a challenge by the honorable union minister for transport to ramp it up rapidly and uh, the project is being led by my sister laboratory here in delhi mm. central road research institute so they've been looking at bitumen alternatives for a while but from our side because we repurpose carbon atoms that's one of our mandate so we saw that there was a lot of carbon atom in the agricultural waste of this country and in not all agricultural waste is the same right they're all different rice husk is different from rice straw rice straw is different from cotton stock cotton stock is different from mustard tilli or sugarcane trash so we actually started a global mapping program we are using uh, support from india's uh, space mapping agencies to look at how the biomass is distributed across india and how it seasonally changes and that told us that we needed to find a sasta sundar tikau application and that's how it plugged into biobitumen so that's a large scale application which we can do slightly different from each biomass but not so different that can't go into that application and what do you think like while we talk about you know husk and straw like what do you think is the solution to delhi's air pollution specifically like during this point of time because this conversation starts like every year at the same point of time yeah and i have you know mentioned this many times you probably should speak to a company called presbl punjab renewable energy okay. services private limited they have started to turn this into an opportunity because anything that is burnt does two things it is consuming a fuel which india is short of anyway and it is generating carbon dioxide which india does not need anyway so all you have to do is find ways to use it on site or collect it efficiently presbill is doing good work there what we are trying to do is the other opposite we are taking the machine to the field so we have a portable thing which we call the pyroformer this was built with technology collaboration of iit roper and aston university in the uk and this little truck mounted machine goes into a field takes the parali from there and turns it into biochar and into fuel oil and the fuel oil can be used to run let's say an eta bhatti and the biochar can go back into soil conditioning so these kinds of solutions but similarly my sister lab in bhopal ampri they are taking this rice straw and rice husk and they're making particle boards that reduces the amount of deforestation you need to do to get wood right so many possible things but like when we have these solutions so like why every year does this problem like come back uh because for a market to accept it you need to establish performance cost and scale before you can establish sustainability so in most of these cases we are typically in early technology readiness levels where performance has been proven um scale is possible but it's the chicken and egg of you know who will pay for 16 rupees solar power in the beginning who will pay for a more expensive particle board in the beginning so the answer lies in social consciousness the kind of thing that you people are doing raising awareness and saying that which building material supplier is more sustainable you know can they prove they are sustainable what's the data how many tons of deforestation have they been able to save by using agricultural waste instead you know demand metrics not uh, statements if a company says i'm sustained put out a sustainable report ask for the metrics right if a company says that you know we do green chemistry ask them to prove that it's green compared to the next best alternative 
So the more questions that are asked, the more the discourse goes towards evidence-based decision-making and evidence-based outcomes, the faster we will move to a solution. My last question to you is, give me any, like you have had such a long career, give me probably any one incident or any one moment that is like most special to you. You didn't just call me old, no? But if you ask me for my most significant moment in, in time, it is actually something my PhD guide said to me many years ago. He was a Nobel laureate. He got the Nobel Prize in 2000. And during some conversation, he said, and he used to like to repeat this line, that it is the narrowness of the human mind that we divide knowledge into compartments. And I think that stayed with me. So anytime I'm looking to develop a solution or solve a problem or come out with an innovation, I will actually go out and look for the agriculturists, the historians, the social scientists, the economists, all the people who know what I don't know. Because those are the pieces that make an outcome succeed. I think that is my big single learning point. Thank you for sharing that with us and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.